I turn your attention this morning to 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 1. Thank you for being here this morning. 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 1. I want to read a passage of scripture that we read a couple of weeks ago as we talked about the season of silence. And I want to extract something from these verses that I believe will be a blessing. I'm so thankful for the Word of God. Isn't the Word of God rich? The principles of God's Word lead us and guide us in our walk with God. And Ahab told Jezebel, Ahab was a king at this time. He had uh, some Jewish upbringing, but he had married Jezebel and everything went south after that. She was just a devil. That's the only way I know how to describe her. And together they were uh, an unholy couple. We'll just say it that way. And they declared war on all of righteousness. And I feel like we live in a world today that has declared war on righteousness. But I've come to take God's going to have the final say. I said God's going to have the final say. And they declared war on Elijah, who was a prophet, the declar the, the, the one who declared righteousness. And if you declare righteousness in an unholy world, you're going to be caught in the crosshairs. But if God be for you, who can be against you? Maybe that'll encourage somebody today. I don't know what you're going through, but God's on your side. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. There'd been a big challenge on Mount Carmel, what God could answer by fire. Of course, Jehovah God did, and the other prophets, prophets of Baal, were false prophets, and they were all slain. Verse 2, then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. In other words, I'm going to kill you by this time tomorrow. And when he saw that, this referring to Elijah, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I'm not better than my father's. You've got to be careful about the voices that you allow to speak into your life. If you listen to every message that comes from people that are not of God, you will be so despondent in your own spirit that you will not want to continue. There are some voices in your life that you just need to turn off. And Elijah, who was a holy man, he's a prophet used of God, called fire down from heaven, but he was a human being just like you and I, and he was affected by this message. Verse 5, and as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him. Oh, thank the Lord. I'm so glad that heaven intervenes. Doesn't leave us on our own to deal with the matters of this world. Behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake, bacon on the coals. I mean, heaven sent a hot meal. Not a cold sub. And a cruise of water at his head. I don't know how much a cruise is, but I got a feeling that's more than one drink. And he did eat and drink and lay him down again. Didn't even say thank you. He just rolled over and ate and drank and went back to sleep. I mean, if I was that angel, I would have said, hey, you know, I live in heaven. I don't have to be here. How about a little, you know, appreciation? And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, arise and eat because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat. Everybody say that meal. That meat. that meat. 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb, which was Mount Sinai, unto the Mount of God. I want to sort of lift our message from the seventh verse. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time. I want to speak this morning on this subject, the second meal. The second meal. Oh, hallelujah. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, we're so thankful to be in your house today. Thankful for the opportunity to worship you one more time. What a great God you are, Lord. You've already allowed us to sit in heavenly places. I ask you now, Lord, through your word, if you would use us as a messenger to minister to your people, let us be changed from the inside out. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. 
you may be seated. Thank you so much for standing. I have to say that in this season of food delivery um, with uh, DoorDash and Uber Eats and Grubhub and Instacart that uh, I'm just overjoyed by the whole thing. I mean, it's one thing to be able to get a good meal. It's another thing when they bring it to your door like Christmas time. And you just, just drop it there. They don't even have to say hello. You, they just drop it. You open it. It's like, yay! And Instacart. I have learned through COVID that you can just order groceries from Publix and they just bring it to your door. You don't even have to go to Publix no more. They'll bring it right to your door, drop it off. Oh, that's a cool thing. But it would be really cool to have an angel bring it. Can you imagine just having an angel bring you food? How cool would that be? I got to thinking about what we would call a food delivery service from heaven. What would we call it? I come up with some ideas. I want to run these by you this morning. You just let me know which one you like by applause. We have an applause meter here that will judge. The first name I came up with was Dove Dash. Not too much. The crowd's just warming up. The second one was Mana Magic. A little bit more. The third one came from Brother Gregory, Godsin. God's groceries. Not too much. Master's table. That, that may be the winner. Quick quail. <laughs> Java Jara. They specialize in coffee. Stole that from Jacksonville. Emmanuel Eats. Not too much. Heaven's Helpings. No? Raven Ready. And last but not least, my favorite, Holy Cow. <laughs> I mean, I've had some great meals in my life, but I would love just one time before I die to have an angel bring me food. Heaven, if you're listening... If you could just send an angel down and bring me food, two beautiful things coming together, the presence of God and the presence of food. <laughs> Woo! I mean, if an angel brings food, what do they bring? I have a feeling they bring like angel hair pasta, maybe some angel food cake for dessert. I mean, that would cheer up anybody. Elijah was down. He was discouraged. I mean, he crawled up under a juniper tree out in the wilderness and asked God to just go ahead and take my life. I'm tired of fighting. I'm tired of dealing with Jezebel and all her house of crazies. I just am the only one left that even cares about you. And then this angel shows up with some food. He makes a cake on hot coals, has to wake him up. I mean, you'd think Elijah would at least smell the food, it was hot, it was good. But he's in such a funk, I mean, he's not even waking up. The angel has to wake him up. He looks over and sees the food, eats it, goes back to sleep, never says anything. Well, here's something you need to know about this first meal. This meal was for his past. It was to encourage him and give him a reassurance that he was not alone. I want to say this to somebody here today. Don't ever think that God doesn't care about your past so many times we talk about the future and we talk about heaven and we talk about what all God wants to do with our our future and our destiny and our calling and we forget that God cares about your past he created you he knows every working part emotionally mentally he understands that your past can easily affect where you are he is not unconcerned about your past. He knows what you have been through. He knows that it is affecting your present. And he sends little messages. He sends little meals, as it were, to encourage you and to remind you 
that you can't change your past, uh, but you don't have to be defined by your past. What a great God we serve. He's not just around when everything's going great and you're throwing your hat to the ceiling and you're saying, bless the Lord, oh my soul. He's there when you don't want to talk to anybody. He's there when you don't want to see anybody. He's there when you're down and you're discouraged and you know you shouldn't be, but you're there anyhow and you're not sure how to get out of it. I've come to tell you that God is an ever-present help in a time of need. Oh, hallelujah. He says, here's a hot meal. This is a delivery from heaven to lift your head, to lift your spirits, and to remind you that you are not alone. Oh, hallelujah. I know that in our modern day vernacular, we've talked a lot about comfort food, but I've come to tell you that God Almighty is the one who originated comfort food. He's got what you need. He knows you're weary in a hot day, in a hot land, at a bad time. But oh my God, hallelujah. He has got a table spread where the saints of God are fed. Come and dine, come and dine. Abraham had a couple of meals with God. The first one we read about in Genesis 15, it involved a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old goat, a three-year-old ram. Whew, that's a lot of food right there. A turtle dove, not sure about that, and a young pigeon. That's how the Bible describes it. And he had all this meal there and the Lord came and communed with him and they devoured the meal. But then the Bible said the carcasses that were left out there, the birds tried to come in and take the carcass. And Abraham was out there and he was trying to defend the carcass. I mean, they'd already had the meal. He'd already had a visitation from God. But now he's out there trying to defend the carcasses of what's left over. Oh, I think Abraham knew that this meal represented the presence of God. And even though the meal had been consumed and God was maybe not there present at that moment where Abraham could feel him, but still he was protecting the scraps. He was protecting the carcasses. Oh, my friends, sometimes uh, when you come to the house of the Lord uh, and God blesses you uh, and you feel the strength of his spirit uh, and you feel like he has served you a meal through the word of God. Uh, oh, my friend, you get out there in the world uh, and the birds start to try to come and, and steal your blessing and the birds start to try to come uh, and the voices from this world and all the challenges uh, and all the stress and all the strife. Oh, my friend, uh, you got to protect the sacrifice it may just be scraps that are left over but you got to call to your remembrance I remember what God told me I remember he's got my future he's got my past God's at work in my life you got to protect the sacrifice mm. Abraham felt like he was all alone he's out there shooing away birds God was with him. The Lord said to Abraham, the Bible said Abraham had a darkness come over him. And the Lord said, Abraham, your children will be a stranger in a land that's not theirs and shall serve them for 400 years. We talk a lot about that promise that he gave to Abraham about his seed would be as the stars of the sky and the sand of the sea. But do you ever hear it preached that in this first meal, told Abraham your children are going to be in slavery for 400 years this of course was referring to the children of Israel that would be in slavery in Egypt the children of Abraham would become slaves and servants for 400 years oh this first meal is oftentimes difficult this first meal is preparation to deal with what would be a dark time in the history of the Jewish people. A blight, a stain, a dark season. And so this first meal, Abraham gets this news. But I choose to look at this in a different light today. I choose to look at this and think God does not run from those tough times. Those difficult times. 
when you feel all alone and maybe even people have separated themselves from you. God is not a fair weather friend. I said, he's come to have dinner with you in your difficult moments. He's come to sit down with you when you don't feel like you can go any further and you feel like you're at your wits end and you feel like everything you've been trying to do, nothing's going to work. And it feels like your sacrifice that you work hard to prepare is nothing more but being devoured by the birds of this world. And oh, there's a darkness that's coming over you. But oh, my friend, I've come to remind you that in the midst of it, God said, I'm still there. I've come to have lunch with you. I've come to bring you a meal. I know you don't even feel like shouting. I know you don't feel like standing. And I know you know that that you don't feel that way, but you feel that way anyhow. God said, that's okay. I still love you. I'm still working on you. I still got something to encourage you and to lift your spirit. Oh, thank you, Jesus. He's not only concerned about your past. He prepares you for what will become your past. The first meal is always the most difficult. It's the most awkward. It's like the first date. Any of you remember when you went on your first date with your spouse? Nobody? Everybody immediately got laryngitis when I said that. You remember that first date? How awkward it was. That awkward silence. You tried to think of something to say that wouldn't sound corny or creepy <laughs> or disconcerting. You wanted to be clever and maybe even comical, but at the very least, conversational. But instead, your mind went blank and you just left feeling awkward. You begin to think, this person will never go out with me again. Back in February, Sister Amy and I were in uh, San Antonio, Texas with brother and sister Urshan, Joel and Heidi Urshan, and we were eating one night late down on the river walk. There's this river that goes through San Antonio. We had been in, in Austin, and then we'd gone down to San Antonio. And uh, as we were as we were sitting down in this little restaurant and drink coffee on the, on the river walk, the, the urchins began to tell us about how their very first date was just right over here. They pointed, it was a few feet from where we were sitting. They had, they had never been back. It was during the, I don't know, maybe 25 years ago when the general conference was in San Antonio. And uh, they, they had gone out on their first date, just a few feet from where we were. And uh, Brother Joel Urshan was just a young evangelist. And, and uh, Sister Heidi has... Her parents had been missionaries for many years in, uh, in Germany. And in fact, I think the Scots uh, worked with the Enuses. They were wonderful missionaries. And, 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 and Heidi had turned 18 years old, raised in Germany, and had now come over to the States, as the missionary children do when they turn uh, 18 years old. And so uh, friends had set them up. And uh, so uh, they went out to eat in, in San Antonio. And they, they began to tell Sister Amy and I about this uh, first date. And Sister Heidi took over the narrative. <laughs> the girls always remember that first date better than the male. And um, they, 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 they went out to eat and she said, first of all, I, I want to say this. She said, we went out to eat with a lot of people. It was not just Brother Joel and I. It was a lot of people. And um, they were all people that I did not know. They were preachers and pastors, and many of them, she says, were middle age at best. At which point I felt compelled to jump in and to defend that demographic. And I said, what's wrong with that? There's nothing's wrong, but I just couldn't relate to this entourage that had come with us. And to make matters worse, she said, Joel, uh, just talked with all the ministers about sermons and about scriptures and about church services And she said I kept trying to think of something that I could say uh, That would add to the conversation and she said I kept waiting for a break 
in the conversation, but everybody was talking at one time. And she said, I was trying to get together my thoughts of what I could say. And, and then I, when I finally, finally figured out what I was saying, I, I looked for the right place to interject. And when I finally got there and there was a pause and I, I, I went to say, I forgot what I was going to say. And she said, I, I, I just was trying to figure out how to fit into this whole deal. And she said, uh, fortunately, she said, Joel had a, a friend of his that was sitting near me and he was very talkative and he engaged her in conversation and he was very funny and they kept talking and all that. And they talked so much that in the course of the meal, one of our preacher friends that's uh, older, retired now, be pastors in Texas, friend of the Russian family for many years, he sees that there's a problem here. So he goes over to Joel and he says, uh, Joel, I'm concerned about this date that you're having with Heidi. I appreciate all the insight that you're giving us on your latest sermons and scriptures, but your friend is talking to her. And though this date may have started with you, it's going to end with him if you don't start talking. And Joel was like, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> and so, <laughs> I mean, Sister Amy and I are laughing so hard as they're telling us about this first date. And... And so they all get up and they're going to walk back along the river walk back to the convention center. And so Joel, uh, having received this admonition from an older friend, pastor, he goes up to Heidi and he goes, so you speak German? <laughs> and she said, yes. At which time Heidi said some other people got his attention. He got distracted and started talking to them for about 10 or 15 minutes. And she said, I just kept walking. And then she said, after about 10 minutes, he came back to me and said, so you speak German. <laughs> she said, yes. And at that time, somebody came and talked to him and he started talking some more. And he talked for about another 10 minutes. And then he realized that he went back over and he said, so you speak German. <laughs> she said, by this time, I'm just nodding. Yes, I speak German. She goes, I didn't know if I'm supposed to start speaking German. <laughs> so she said, we made it all the way back to the convention center. And she said, just before Brother Joel said goodnight to her, he said, so you speak German. <laughs> She's like, thank God I didn't give up on that first date. Well, a few months after that, Brother Joel came and preached here in Florida. And he told me about it. I hadn't met his friend Heidi at the time. He just said, I'm dating this girl, Heidi's missionary's daughter. And he said, this was around Valentine's Day. He was preaching here, doing a youth week for us in our church. This is many years ago. And uh, he said, I'm thinking of doing something special for Valentine's Day. Can you help me set it up? I said, yeah. And he had written this poem and he had a gift being delivered to her house. And she knew he was in Florida. And, and then he was going to read the poem on the phone. And she would think he was in Florida but the gift would have already arrived. But then the last line of the poem reveals that he's actually at her door and he's on his cell phone and he surprises her with his presence. It all went great. She was really excited about it. So then the following year, he comes down, he goes, I'm ready to propose marriage. So I said, what are you, how are you gonna propose to her? He said, well, I was thinking about, you know, she likes to shop. So I was thinking about in the mall that I would just drop down on one knee in the middle of a mall with about a thousand strangers around us. And I would just propose marriage. And I said, uh, I think we can do better than that. He said, well, what do you think? I said, well, you're in Florida. You're ready to propose marriage. She's in Indianapolis. What if we surprised her and flew her down here? And when she got down here, then you could, um, you know, take her out to eat to a nice restaurant. I know a place down here on the water. And then you guys could go down to like Melbourne Beach. You could stroll down along the beach and then you could propose marriage. He said, oh, I like that a lot better. So I said, okay, great, let's do that. So we do, we surprise her, she flies down here and all this and he's preaching one night and I know after the service, I got it all set up for him. I got him set up at the chart house. I got the menu with their names, Joel and Heidi at the top of it. I've trained all the dolphins to come in from the river and to jump. <laughs> <laughs> I gave him my car, I put Sister Barbara Streisand in and she sang to him while they were in the car and she really does need the Lord and uh, and then he takes her to the beach they walk along the beach he proposes to her and they uh, she accepts and they come back and they're all excited and 
I said, oh, that's so awesome. I'm so happy for you guys. You're going to get married all that. And they said, we want you to speak. Will you say something at our wedding? I said, yeah, absolutely. But then a couple months later, him and I are on the phone. I said, Joel, uh, where are you guys, where are y'all going? What are you thinking about for the honeymoon? And he said, I don't know. I, I was hoping maybe you could help us with that. I said, I've never planned somebody else's honeymoon. I'm not sure. He said, well, you travel a lot. Maybe you know where we could go. So I got him set up, you know, at this place down in Acapulco. That used to be a big place people traveled to. Now they go more to Cabo or Cancun. But back then, Acapulco was big. So I got him set up at this nice hotel and all this, and I thought this would be really nice. He was excited about it. They went to this hotel for their honeymoon. Then they tell us, for the first time I've heard this, but as we're eating there in San Antonio, he tells me, and she tells us this story that when they went on their honeymoon, that they were there, and they arrived at night. They go to eat their first meal. And they said, we had not properly budgeted for the honeymoon. And we did not know how expensive meals were at this hotel. They said, we spent our entire budget on the first meal and had to fast the rest of the week. I said, you're welcome. <laughs> he said, I, I'm so thankful, David, you were there because I don't know if we would have ever gotten married. And, and now, you know, General Conference is going to be in Orlando this year in October at the um, Orange County Convention Center. And the first night, Brother Joel Ursh is preaching at the Orange County Convention Center. And I said, see, Heidi, aren't you glad you didn't give up? Aren't you glad you speak German? <laughs> Sometimes that first date is just awkward. Let me tell you what, your first date with God is oftentimes very awkward. Because on that first date, the Lord shines a spotlight on all of your mistakes and all of your scars. And that first meal is really repentance. Your first encounter with God is repentance. And sometimes you say, Lord, I need your help. I recognize my need of you. But you can leave feeling like I am so lost and undone. And I don't know why... God would ever save me. And I don't know what my life is about or what I'm supposed to do. And sometimes the past keeps getting dragged back up in our own minds and in our own imagination. And we have to push through all of that. I've come to give you good news tonight. you got to get to the second meal with God. I said, you got to get to the second meal. Oh, my friend, the same God that met you at a place of repentance, uh, the same God that gave you a meal to deal with your hurt and the pain of your past. Uh, he's not just a one and done uh, kind of God. Uh, he's a God, hallelujah, that if you just stay with him, uh, if you just stick with it, uh, he's got another meal coming. Uh, and that meal is much different than the first. I said it's much different from the first. While your first meal may deal with your hurt and the pain of your past, because that's really your first point of contact with God. It's a place of acknowledging the mistakes, the hurts of your present, and really how much we really need God. There's another meal coming. When the Lord ate with his disciples, and what we oftentimes refer to as the Last Supper, which is a misnomer. It was not the Last Supper. For many of them, it may have even been the First Supper, but it was an awkward night. He was preparing them for the crucifixion. He was having to deal with the fact that Judas was going to deny him. And then he was having to deal with Peter. Peter was not near as spiritual as he thought he was. Oh, Lord, I would never. Peter, before the rooster crows three times, you're going to deny me three times. Oh, Lord, I would never. But that's exactly what happened. It was an awkward night. They left from there, the battle, the Garden of Gethsemane, the, the guards coming into the, the temple guard coming into the uh, Garden of Gethsemane, and, and, and Judas leading them and saying, that's the master, and kissing him. And then Peter trying to slice off that guy's head and missed and hit his ear and cut off the servant's ear. And the Lord picks up the ear and puts it back on the guy's head like Mr. Potato Head Man and tells Peter to put his sword back. What an awkward night. Everything that could go wrong had gone wrong. Sometimes it's like that. And a lot of people don't ever make it to the second meal. 
Peter almost did. He almost died with that, that meal right there at the upper room. You've got to stick around for the second meal. You've got to stick around for the second date. If you find that the first meal is about your past, you'll find that the second meal is about your future. The first meal is about your past. The second meal is about your future. The Bible says weeping endures for the night, but joy cometh in the morning. Every creation day in Genesis concludes with the words, and the evening and the morning, and then it would identify the day. But the evening was always first. Each time the night comes first, then comes the morning. The awkwardness precedes the awakening. The uncomfortableness precedes the anointing. The pain precedes the promise. Death precedes destiny. But the second meal brings hope. If the first meal is about dying out to yourself, the second meal is about waking up to joy and purpose. Oh, sometimes when you first come to the Lord, it's painful because you got to open up and expose your heart and your life to a holy God. And it's awkward on that first day. But oh, there's a God. Hallelujah. He may not reveal it all when you first come into his presence. But if you just keep on coming. If you just keep on believing. If you just keep on serving. There's a second meal that's coming. Elijah had an angel come to him the second time with a second meal. The angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. He arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat. In the strength of that meal. Forty days. The first meal was just enough to make him sleepy again. But the second meal, he's got strength for a journey. Of 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. But guess where he's heading? He's heading to Horeb, which is another name for Sinai, the Mount of God, where the law was first given. Oh, I'm thankful for the second meal. I'm thankful that heaven didn't give up on me on the first meal. I'm thankful that an angel came and said, come on, you got to pick yourself up. You got to realize I got strength for you. I've got provision for you. I've got promise for you. The second meal was about his calling, his destiny, his purpose. The second meal was his future. That meal that Peter had in the upper room with Jesus was difficult. Peter denies that he even knew the Lord. He went out into the night ashamed, disappointed in himself. He had denied that he even knew Jesus as a friend, and yet he had been his best friend. He'd been a savior, but he could not forgive himself. He could not forgive himself. So he got some of his buddies together. Some of them were disciples and said, I go a fishing. He goes fishing back to his old life with his friends. I've walked with God. We've been there with him. But that first meal in the upper room, it was enough to do me in. I can't handle it. He was right. I did deny him three times. I denied that I even knew him. He was dealing with the rejection of his self. Oh, my friends, sometimes you can forgive others, but it's hard to forgive yourself. You're more aware of your own mistakes than anybody else is. And that first meal it reminds you of all of your mistakes. And the conviction of the Holy Ghost when you first come into the presence of a holy God. Oh, some of you remember when you first came to this church, you almost ran out those back doors because you felt the conviction of the Holy Ghost. I'm so glad you stayed. I'm so glad you said, there's something different about that place. I felt the presence of God. And though I'm not comfortable, I'm not giving up. I got to go back. I got to get more of what God has for me. They fish all night. They don't catch any fish. 
And he looks, and there appears to be somebody standing on the shore. It looks like he's got a little fire going through the haze of the night. Can't quite tell, but this looks a little bit like Jesus. But we know he was crucified. Maybe it's a ghost. Can't be a ghost. He's got a fire going. It must be a stranger. Out of curiosity, they steer their boat over that way a little. The voice comes out. Have you any meat? No, we fished all night. We've not caught anything. Throw your nets on the other side of the boat. They've been fishing all night. There's only two sides to a boat. We've been on the other side of the boat. But then they can tell they're fishermen. They can tell this stranger has got fish cooking on a fire. What you spend your life pursuing, God already has it on the shore. Woo! I'm so glad they obeyed him. Sometimes you got to obey him when it doesn't make any sense. When it seems like an impossible situation, you got to just go ahead and obey God. <laughs> they knew when they heard that voice, it was different. Uh, that had to be God. Peter put a coat on and jumped over the boat. Uh, he knew it was his Savior. The net was breaking. They couldn't hardly contain it all. But they got the boat and the net and the fish uh, all to the shore. And the Lord says, come and dine. Come and dine. Peter goes up, he's still ashamed of his own actions. He sits down there next to the Lord. The Lord says, Peter, lovest thou me more than these? I don't think he was talking about the rest of the disciples. I think he was talking about the rest of the fish. <laughs> Peter left the Lord to go back to his fishing. You love God more than your job? The fish was an indication of their success. You identify more with God as a child of God or you do identify more with your job? What is your identity? Peter, lovest thou me more than these? You care about me more than the blessings and the possessions of this world? Yes, Lord, I do. He goes on talking to some more of people. Peter's thinking about what he asked him. After a few minutes, he says, Peter, lovest thou me more than these? Yes, Lord. You know I do. Goes on talking to some other people. Comes back, Peter, you speak German? <laughs> you know I was headed there, didn't you? <laughs> I mean, Peter getting frustrated with the redundancy of this question. But he asked him the third time. I believe it was to cover the three times he denied the Lord. The word of God, things would be said two or three times to establish it. Lovest thou me more than these? Yes, Lord, you know I do. Oh, Peter dealing with the guilt of his pain. Dealing with the frustrations of his own actions. But when he heard the voice of Jesus, he got out of the boat he wasn't even properly dressed. He had to put a coat on. I don't know. I don't know why he was fishing naked. The Bible said he was fishing naked. He must have been fishing and drinking. That's the only way you fish naked is if you're drinking. Whatever he was doing, he was in no position to meet a holy God. But I'm thankful he got out of the boat. Sometimes you got to come to God with all your mess. You got to come to God with all your mistakes. Come on, he'll clean you up. He'll get you in your right mind. He'll get you on the right track. Just come as you are. I said, come as you are. He's got another meal for you. He's preparing something for you. And this is a meal, Peter. That's not about your past. This is a meal about your future. Because in the third time, he says, lovest thou me more than he said, yes, Lord, you know how he said, feed my sheep. Yes, sir. This ain't about you feeling sorry for yourself the rest of your life. Yes, sir. 
This is about you realizing that you're my friend. I know your name. You know my name. And on the rock of this relationship, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Peter, you're going to preach to the Jews on the day of Pentecost. Peter, you're going to preach to the Samaritans whenever there's a revival in Samaria with a young preacher by the name of Philip. You're going to preach to the centurion and the Gentiles in Acts 2. Peter, you're going to open the door to salvation to all three different nationalities. Come on, Peter. I'm giving you your future now. You stuck with me. You had some rough moments, but you're still here. And you love me more than all of these. So I'm going to tell you what your marching orders are. Feed my sheep. It's not about you anymore. It's about the kingdom of God. It's about other people that need to know you got to stick around for one more meal. Peter, you got to love me more than you dislike yourself. You got to love me more than you hate your own actions. Because if the enemy can, he'll get a foothold in your life where you're dealing with the pain of your past and the times that you slap God with your own actions and you have those things brought up in your mind over and over. I've come to tell you, there's a second meal. There's a second meal. There's a God that's sending an angel to give you a second meal today. And to tell you, I got strength for your journey. I got something for you that's gonna help you. You may have a wilderness in front of you, but you got a God that's got another meal. And it's a meal of hope. It's a meal of joy. It's a meal of purpose. It's a meal of anointing. It's a meal of calling. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Oh, would you lift your hands and your voice? Would you call out to God one more time? Jesus. Would you stand to your feet this morning more than anything else? Serving God is about relationship. To really get to know someone, you got to have a second meal. Don't let the hurt and the shame of your past keep you from receiving the blessing of God's abundance. He has a net, a bountiful net, full of blessings. Abraham, you must have been disappointed after that first meal. You must have wondered why you left Syria, follow the direction of God only to learn that your children would be in captivity for 400 years. You must have even doubted that prophecy because you didn't have any children, but you didn't give up. You protected the sacrifice from the birds of your own doubt, from the birds of your own questions. You had to shoo them away. Sometimes, my friend, you got to shoo away your own thoughts, your own questions. Cause doubt to come in and steal your sacrifice. I'm so glad, Abraham, you stayed close to God. Because the second meal made all the difference for Abraham. Genesis 18 tells us about the second meal that Abraham had with the Lord. It was an angelic presence appeared to him in the form of a man, a theophany. Others were there, maybe angels, angelic beings, other theophanies. But the presence of God and an angelic host. Abraham invited them into his tent. He killed a calf and made biscuits and gravy. You think I'm making it up? Read Genesis 18. He took butter and milk poured it into the gravy it was quite a meal it was the second meal it was here at the second meal the Lord told Abraham 
he and Sarah, his wife, would have a child. They were both in their 90s at this point. But nothing is impossible with God. It was his destiny. It was his future that was revealed in the second meal. Was his anointing. There were times that he was going to be tested again. Came a time whenever the Lord told him to take his son, his only son, Isaac. The Bible says it that way. Take him up to the top of the mountain. Offer him as a sacrifice. There had to be something God knew about Abraham. He watched him protect that sacrifice from the birds when it was nothing but carcasses. After he had received the bad news, the future, his people would be captivity. He told him to take his son, his only son, the one that had been given in, by a prophetic word in the second meal. Take him up to the top of the mountain. I believe the Lord knew he would protect that promise just as he had the first one. But he had to know, lovest thou me more than thee? Do you love me more than the blessings? Do you love me more than the fulfilled promises? He got a revelation. For he ain't ever made the journey because he told his servants, the lad and I will return. The Bible says later on in Hebrews that Abraham believed that God could raise him up from the dead. There's never a sacrifice you put on that altar that God doesn't take note of. He's going to bless you for the sacrifice. He's come to give you a word today. Somebody, you're being pulled back by the memories of your past, but I feel the Holy Ghost pulling you towards your future. Come on, the promise is going to propel you to a place of fulfillment. The first meal is the crucifixion, but the second meal is the resurrection. The first meal is repentance, but the second meal is Holy Ghost and filling. Woo! Hallelujah! Some people don't ever get to the second meal. That's why it's easy to keep going back to your sins. As Proverbs says, a dog returning to its vomit because you only work to the first meal. And there's a God that says there's a second meal. There's a resurrection spirit. It's the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. It's for everybody. The angel told Elijah, eat. This is strength for the journey. The Holy Spirit of God is strength for the journey. Paul described it as righteousness, peace, and joy. That's a five-course meal right there. Come and dine. Maybe you've met God at that first meal. You've had some questions about the journey. I believe I've come to you in the Holy Ghost today to tell you this. He's got a second meal prepared for you. And it's about your future. God has seen every sacrifice. He's seen you work to protect it. Not knowing what tomorrow was going to hold. God's got a word for you today. There's a second meal. There's an angel that's been dispatched from heaven. He's got a meal prepared for you. He's got a word prepared for you. The presence of God is pulling you. I believe this is why Elijah did not reject Elisha when he said what do you want Elisha said I want a double portion because Elijah had learned it's not just the portion of the first meal it's a double portion it's the portion of the second meal the first meal dealt with my past but the second meal is dealing with my future and I need a double is there anybody in this building that said I need a double portion of the anointing of God to deal with not only my past but my future Come on, all over this building, would you lift your hands right now? Come on, would you allow the Word of God to serve you one more time?
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, the Holy Ghost is drawing people. I open up this altar for a first, a second, or a third meal. Would you feel God pulling you? Would you step out from where you're standing? Would you come to this altar?
help me. 